Welcome everyone to the second episode of our Art and Wellbeing webinar series on the topic of how art can ease the transition back to office life. So following Boris Johnson's speech on the 22nd of February, the UK now has an exit plan in sight. And whilst some of our EU counterparts are currently experiencing a third wave, um, the ongoing vaccination program across the continent is allowing us to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This in turn allows us to slowly wrap our minds around the fact that we will be slowly going back to office life, either on a full or a part-time basis. And whatever your preference may be, it is expected, if not undeniable, that some people will struggle to readapt to office life. In this episode, we will be discussing what can be done to ease this transition and adapt to a new normal in the workplace. And especially, whether art can play a role therein. We will also be discussing how art can be used as a tool to effectively communicate corporate values and not only boost employee morale, but also encourage team bonding. If you have any questions during the webinar for our speakers, then please enter them in the Q&A or the chat, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. So to begin, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Luigi Di Iorio, CEO of Human Solutions and Emotional Intelligence Adjunct Prof Professor. Andrea Seminara, CEO of Red Hedge Asset Management. And Francesca Casaraghi, CEO of London Trade Art. Let's begin with Luigi, who will be pro providing an overview of a new mindset for a new normality, outlining why emotional intelligence is so important during the pandemic, how to manage this change in normality in the long term, and how to anticipate as well as adapt to the new normal. Mm, I'm Luigi Di Iorio. I'm speaking from Milan, Milan and I'm an um, expert in emotional intelligence, and I work for uh, um, uh, Open Human Solutions, that is a little company based in Milan that provides to deliver some courses based on emotional intelligence. And uh, I'm also a um, professor at uh, Liuk University, that's a private university so close to Milan, uh, in which I deliver um, this, uh, this topic called uh, uh, emotional intelligence and relationship management. Today, I would like to discuss with you um, about uh, um, some few elements uh, that are regarding the transition uh, uh, to the new normality, how to return to the new normality. And I would like to discuss uh, uh, along three elements, uh, along three points. Uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some uh, few charts, uh, but I need to the possibility to, uh, to share. Um, and uh, I, I ask, you, ask, ask you to um, give me the possibility to share, because in this moment, uh, I can't. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Ah, okay. Okay, perfect. Now I can. Okay. Just a moment because I prepared some uh, charts and I would like to share with you uh, what, I, what, I, uh, what I prepared. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, three elements, uh, as you can see uh, in this uh, um, presentation. The first one is... Uh, how to anticipate and, and adapt to uh, the, the, the new normal. And the second is uh, to present uh, um, some elements regarding the world of emotional intelligence, the leadership uh, uh, competence model uh, um, about Daniel Goleman uh, uh, research and uh, the meaning of the resilience that is an important element in this transition from the crisis to the uh, to the to the new normal to the new normality. Uh, the, the, the first uh, element that I would like to share with you is uh, that um, uh, the characteristic. Uh, uh, so we, we are living in, in the crisis in this moment uh, due to, to the pandemic situation, and the, the characteristic of a, a crisis uh, is that things are never going back to the way they were. Uh, you think they are or well, we would like to get uh, back to business as usual, but uh, it's impossible because it never works out that way. And uh, um, for example, whether it's, it's the banking system, if we consider the banking system after uh, 2008 and 2009, it didn't go back to the way and everything had changed. 
and um, uh, I, I think we, we got to look at how leaders perceive what the new normal might be. And, uh, and you, as a leader, need to step up to that to try to and, and understand what it's going, it's going to be. And then how can my organization or myself win in that new uh, environment? Uh, the question is, how can we contribute to, to the success in the new environment and how uh, we can adapt our company or myself quickly to all of the changes that we have to make? That, that's the question. Because it, it's never going to, um, to be the like the old times. So maybe some of the businesses that we had are not going to, to work out. But, but, but we have to go... Uh, to what are the really important things coming up? Uh, and we need to understand what's, what's going to be post-crisis. Uh, an example uh, that I would like to share with you is, is about uh, um, an example of a great leader who really anticipated to the new normal is Alex Gorsky. Uh, it is uh, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, Alex Gorsky is uh, very well grounded in J and J's credo, the Johnson and Johnson's credo, that is, uh, uh, we're there to help patients. And at the time of the crisis, J and J had a small businesses, the vaccines business, which they had just gotten into a few years before. But he knew that the thing that was going to transform for the future and become the new normal was uh, uh, to the new normal was helping people to get vaccine. Um, and uh, uh, so he put all the resources of J and J, tore everything else out, and put all the focus on, on getting this vaccine, and had a tremendous amount of energy, a billion dollar investment. Uh, not knowing if he could come up with, with it. But he was willing to bet the company, let's go do, to do that because we know that uh, what we have to do to solve the problem, not just this virus, but a future virus that will come along because coronavirus is not going to be the last problem uh, that we are going to have. Uh, of course, we, ho we hope it is, but probably but it's unlikely it's going to be so even this wasn't his most profitable business uh, he was willing to put the, the focus on what really mattered and see um, and see where things were going to be in the future past and move forward just like when Gretzky the famous hockey player always say don't skate to where the puck is but skate where it's going to be and uh, that's what uh, Alex was doing. He was skating ahead and he was willing to convert all his manufacturing facility to make uh, this real, to help people, because he knew that it was the core of J&J's credo. Another important element uh, to, uh, to, to, to manage this trans transition is to discover the power of emotional intelligence. Huh? And so we have to discuss, we have to talk about the Daniel Golem that coined the, the term uh, emotional intelligence or EQ. In other uh, words, emotional intelligence is how effectively we manage ourselves and our relationship. Every organization, um, as you can see in this chart, uh, achieves its goals through a series of daily conversation interactions and decisions and each of these involves humans and the more emotional intelligence they are the more effective they will be on every level emotional intelligence has four main components as you can see in this matrix that can be plotted in this matrix or matrix the first area is self-awareness uh, which focuses on how well you know yourself, including your values, strengths, weaknesses, uh, in comparison to how others perceive you. The next area, the second area, is self-control, uh, which is about managing your emotions and action in a, in a productive way. The third area is uh, 
the social intelligence, so-called emotional intelligence, uh, is about uh, the awareness of ours, knowing their emotions and uh, needs, uh, as well as their skills, uh, preferences, uh, and other aspect of diversity. And uh, finally, uh, including empathy. It is the power to understand the other feelings. Finally, uh, the fourth area is building relationship and how uh, we use uh, our awareness of others to, ma to maximize uh, their potential and our uh, relationship. Um, it's important to say that in this model, uh, we find uh, um, the resilience. The resilience is uh, a, a core competence uh, uh, inside this model, inside the, uh, this uh, uh, model uh, um, called emotional intelligence. And uh, to describe the resilience, I would like to make an example. Uh, imagine that you have two choice between the state of mind that helps you deal with challenges you face successfully using mistakes uh, you make uh, as a reason to enhance your performance and thrive, or uh, uh, you could rely on a mindset which makes uh, every mistake feel like a disaster and every challenge feel like a mountain that's just too high. Which would you choose? Uh, of course, uh, during challenge times, uh, uh, developing your psychological resilience uh, we buffer against stress and anxiety, and it, it, it will help you to boost your performance. What is the release, resilience in few words? Resilience is the ability to deal with challenges effectively, effectively, but using those challenges as a learning experience and then a catalyst to, to thrive. There are two sides to resilience. On one hand, uh, developing your resilience uh, will help you to cope with challenges. And uh, honing your resilience uh, will also enable you to enhance your performance, getting closer to that peak performance level. And it's important in this transition from the crisis uh, to the new normality to use uh, the resilience uh, and to use this experience uh, um, like a moment uh, to, to gain new competence, new competences. A resilient mindset will also help you uh, reach your peak performance. And uh, there really is no better way to develop your professional image than to work in a zone of peak performance. Uh, for example, imagine, uh, imagine uh, that you have to training uh, to run a marathon. Your training program states each, uh, each week you run uh, a little further, helping you to prepare for that uh, final, I don't know, uh, 26, 26 mile race. You get to the stage in your training. Uh, where you've built up to the 10 mile mark and while start running, you, you, you fall and hurt your ankle. After weeks uh, of physical therapy, uh, your ankle is healed and you uh, go back to your training. Now, would you be happy to get back to that 10 mile mark and uh, part your training program? Would you feel like you've got to wear uh, you were in your program and that's enough. Uh, you have the option of using the injury as a learning experience. That's the secret of the resilience, helping you to get stronger at running, achieving more in your future running performance. This is how uh, uh, resilience works. Learning from, uh, finally, to conclude my speech, uh, uh, learning from challenging situations uh, and even mistakes uh, in order to get better at what you are doing, enhancing your uh, performance along the way. And uh, uh, you need to be more emotionally intelligent because uh, um, is the uh, important capability 
uh, and skill to manage this transition from the crisis uh, to the new normality. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi, for these very interesting insights. Um, resilience is definitely the key here. Um, so um, I'd like to move on to Francesca now, um, who will be providing us with an overview of how art in the office can boost employee morale and productivity, as well as engage clients and enhance the CSR of, of firms of any size. Thank you very much, Aurelia. Thank you, of course, everyone for joining this webinar. And uh, thank you, Luigi, for your very interesting and precious uh, contribution. As we all know, we have been facing big changes over the past year, and surely some of these new habits are irreversible. Emotional intelligence can be key in managing this transition to what Luigi called the new normal. And we believe that also art can surprisingly help this transition back to office life. After nearly a year of remote working, it's quite normal and expected that uh, many actually will struggle to readapt to office life. So in this episode of uh, this webinar series dedicated to art and well-being, I would like to focus on how art in the office can be an engaging, positive and uh, motivational addendum, able to boost uh, the morale and sense of belonging of employees as well as clients. I would also like to mention some uh, virtuous examples of corporates which greatly invested in art, uh, turning it into a distinguishing mark uh, of the company, which enhanced the retention and reputation of the brand. There have been many studies about the impact of art on employees' satisfaction. I would like to mention a few of them. The first one is the Exeter University School of Psychology study, which has proven that art can improve the employees' productivity by 17%. While another study by the CAS Business School here in London demonstrated that 64% of employees agreed that art in the workplace made them feel more motivated at work. Also, the positive impact of art on keeping employees happy was recorded since over 80% of people questioned say that art groups improved their sense of well being. In fact, people who work in environments decorated with, uh, uh, let's say, aesthetically engaging art uh, typically experience less stress and anger in response to, for example, task-related task frustration and to help to build a more collaborative and enjoyable workplace. A study of 32 companies from very different fields found that 78% of employees agreed that art in the workplace reduces stress. 64% of them that it boosts creativity and 77% that it encourages expression. So apologies for all these numbers, you may find them confusing, but I thought that it was very important to concretely demonstrate with the scientific data, the power that art can bring to the office. And in addition to boosting motivation and creativity, uh, featuring art uh, in the workplace uh, can also be the key to a company's rotation strategy, uh, being also a good uh, conversation starter, for example. As highlighted by the Making Art Work in the Workplace report, uh, um, if 80% of business costs is people, then it makes financial sense to make uh, corporate employees feel as good in the office as possible. And supporting good employee mental health really does help businesses, businesses thrive and uh, workforce uh, stay healthy. Uh, viewing artwork uh, helps workers restore also mental energy and reduce stress, as said. And unsurprisingly, both of these effects boost brain performance. Uh, but displaying art throughout the workplace is just the first step. The key to successfully incorporating it in company philosophy is to allow employees to engage and interact with the artwork. Uh, according to another study, I promise this is the last one, of uh, 2,000 
thousand office workers, employees are up to 32% more productive when given control over the design of the workplace. As a result, there are uh, uh, some organizations like uh, Art at Work, for example, which offer art workshops uh, as a way to promote workplace well-being and to encourage team building. Among their services, there is also, uh, for example, a workshop dedicated to creating large-scale canvases to decorate the workplace while at the same time promoting positive interaction among employees of all ranks. So all these studies and examples, um, I hope that gave you an idea of how art can have a strong impact on employees' well-being. While from a corporate point of view, surely businesses and large corporations uh, investing in collection of fine art is a tradition dating a few centuries back. Early banks, for example, during the Italian Renaissance, uh, were often uh, patrons of the arts. And uh, the first uh, corporate collection is actually considered to be uh, the collection by Monte de Paschi di Siena, which was formed during the Renaissance in the 15th century. Of course, at first art served only as a decoration for the walls, uh, but over time, corporate art collections have grown into what I call a status symbol. Uh, I think that the greatest example is, uh, of course, the Deutsche Bank collection, which is also the largest corporate collection of art in the world, uh, with around 60,000 artworks uh, across 900 offices in 40 countries. And uh, mm, the Deutsche Bank uh, could meet commitment uh, is also remarkable in uh, uh, hosting many art initiatives uh, like tol talks by artists. They also created an app to give employees uh, more information about the work in front of them. And they set up uh, the uh, so-called Artotech, where employees can seek expert uh, art advice. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think uh, they really um, uh, engage uh, and involve their employees uh, through democratic art committees, uh, allowing employees uh, to be directly involved in the choice of the artworks to be displayed. As I said, it has been proven that uh, if the art selection process is more democratic and collaborative, it can encourage those same values at work, uh, boosting team building and allowing employees to feel more connected, not only to one another, but also to the company itself. And just to mention one artwork uh, uh, of the Deutsche Bank collection, I'm sure that everyone will be impressed by seeing the Gerhard Richter's uh, artwork uh, in the um, Wall Street uh, uh, lobby in New York. And uh, visitors can see the three canvases even before entering the building. And I think the message that the bank in this case is trying to communicate is quite clear. Um, of course, another great example is the UBS collection uh, with uh, over 30, um, 35,000 pieces of modern and contemporary art. And uh, it's quite interesting how the Swiss bank mainly acquires works by relatively unknown uh, emerging and mid-career artists. Then, then turn, turn out to be the greatest artist um, in the contemporary art scene. In fact, the bank right now uh, is loaning and gifting its art to major museums like MoMA, um, even though the main collection is displayed uh, still in uh, the employee-only areas. Uh, also interesting is the fact that uh, UBS um, rotates the collection among the UBS locations every year or two, uh, giving the opportunity to, to employees to uh, enjoy an ever-changing environment with the works by Basquiat, Lucian Freud, Lichtenstein and Christopher Wool, just to mention some of them. Um, of course, it's worth to, to mention uh, um, the JP Morgan Chase collection and the Bank of American Art collection. The first one was started by David Rockefeller back in 1959, while the Bank of American Art collection uh, is one of the largest and finest uh, in the world. But uh, luckily, there are not only banks which invest in art. Uh, one of the biggest corporate art collection is the insurance company uh, Progressive. 
of uh, collection. And I found uh, its story quite uh, inspiring as the founder, Peter Lewis, uh, unveiled the new progressive corporate headquarters uh, um, in uh, 1974. And he envisioned a unique modern space that reflected the creative and innovative culture of the company. So to achieve that vision, it purchased some uh, uh, contemporary artworks uh, to display throughout the building. And uh, he saw this not only as a way to re-energize the workspace, uh, but also as an opportunity to provoke passionate discussion. And uh, as he stated, uh, to foster a culture of risk, risk learn and grow. So right now, each year, thousands of uh, their employees, uh, but also their family and friends um, and the public uh, engage with the collection uh, throughout uh, many art initiatives. And another company that I wanted to mention um, that uses art to keep the spirits high is the Norwegian gas giant Statoil that uh, hangs uh, works of contemporary artists uh, on both the office spaces and the drilling platforms to inspire and delight its workers. And finally, of course, the Microsoft Art Collection. Uh, since uh, 1987, uh, the collection serves uh, only the, for uh, the enjoyment of the employees, guests, and customers. So clearly, uh, corporates are collecting art, uh, not only as an investment, but uh, maybe most importantly, as an asset, which represents the corporate's values, able to enhance the corporate's image and the corporate social responsibility. In this sense, at London Trade Art, we had the privilege to work with corporates, uh, such as hedge funds and law firms, uh, which were eager to represent their values uh, through contemporary art. And thanks to the organization of uh, temporary art programs uh, and through our bespoke art advisory service, they started to feature contemporary artists within uh, the working spaces with the aim to express their brand identity and to show the philanthropic side of their businesses which turned out to be very motivational and uplifting also for the members of the team. And uh, in the time when everybody, I think, wants to work remotely, art in the office uh, might be just what corporates need to keep employees excited about coming to work every day. Um, it also happened that uh, some of the companies we have worked with then acquired a few pieces from the exhibitions displayed, starting their very own corporate collection. Um, I previously mentioned some of the uh, biggest and most renowned companies in the world, which created a remarkable corporate art collections during the time. So many could think that investing in art is a privilege, almost a whim of companies with the incomes of billions. Uh, but there are instead many ways to collect art and to support talents suitable for companies of all sizes. First of all, corporates don't necessarily have to refer to blue chips artists when approaching art collecting. As I said, also UBS, when it started to collect art, purchased at first emerging talents, who then acquired international recognition as the bank, through a few very successful sales, was able to expand its collection with higher and valued artworks. So in my opinion, it's actually wiser to start collecting fewer and less valued but high quality pieces and then increase the amount and value of the collection over time. Uh, investing in a new and let's call trendy artists would convince also clients that you are a dynamic company that follows trends. With this regard, professional guidance, I think, is key when acquiring art. And as part of their support for art, uh, corporates uh, could also invest in commissions, uh, potentially reducing the economic impact on the investment and allowing an ad hoc artwork created for uh, their own workplaces. Um, again, art commissions are not a completely new trend, of course. Uh, even back in 1985, uh, Equitable Life Assurance Society commissioned famous artists like uh, Solevit and Roy Lichtenstein to create artworks for their headquarters. Um, but surely the trend has definitely uh, risen in popularity in recent years. Um, 
for example, software developer Adobe uh, recently hired a graffiti artist and Mac and Mike Giant to create a branded art for their office, uh, while Facebook uh, created an artist in residence program which hosts a variety of, I have to say, mostly local artists were selected to work together with the company's employees to produce artworks for the office walls. And these artworks are then acquired by the company that uses them to not only embellish the space, but also to communicate the company values and culture. And apart from commissioning site specific artworks, uh, there are many other ways to contain the investment. Corporates can organize temporary exhibition, for example, taking advantage of enjoying an ever changing collection in the office and using art to make constant little changes that can make people feel as if their office is constantly evolving. And uh, another smart and innovative way of art collecting that uh, we propose at London to Art is to allow corporates to become corners of high quality artworks. Um, fractional ownership is in fact uh, a rising and increasingly interesting art purchasing model, which could bring uh, many benefits uh, to corporates, starting from the temporary holding of uh, the uh, artworks co-owned, the possibility to physically hold them and display the artwork in the corporate offices for a limited time frame. Or moreover, the possibility to benefit of eventual capital gains thanks to the sale or the loan of the artwork owned to other institutions or galleries. And it could also, of course, be part of the strategy to enhance the corporate social responsibility and to improve the image and reputation of the company, as we already uh, said. We also offer the organization of online and offline events to enhance also the corporate spaces and to improve team building and to engage uh, new clients. And finally, art co-ownership can also be seen as an innovative investment to diversify the corporate's portfolio or moreover corporate could offer the service to their clients, expanding their investment services and engaging a potential new uh, clientele. So in conclusion, what uh, I wanted to express, I think, is that uh, it could be quite beneficial in addition to displaying art throughout the workplace, if offices on one end really aim to involve their employees in art related activities, and on the other end, if they explain to clients the values behind the artworks hung at the walls. Investing in a variety of artworks can surely help retain employees and encourage positive feelings about their work environment and their role therein, uh, but also can inspire and uh, make a good impression uh, on clients. Um, interpersonal interaction also results from heart that sparks discussion inside and outside the team. Uh, of course, there is still much research to be done in this field, but initial data shows that a clear link between art and the office um, and an overall, overall satisfaction as well as well-being. Uh, so if creativity, innovation and open conversation are elements of an organization culture, the placement of engaging artwork can help sub substantiate these values and make them uh, visually available. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I'd like to move on to Andrea now. Um, as I'm sure you're all, you're all interested to know how Red Hedge uses um, everything that Francesca mentioned um, to uh, communicate company values and, uh, and boost morale. Thank you very much, uh, Aurelia. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so I'm Andrea Seminar. I'm the CAO and CIO of Red Edge Asset Management. And for once, I'm not here to speak about us and our product and how amazing it is, but about something else, which is our contribution to the art market. Um, first of all, art market did bring me, art in general did bring me back to the office because I just realized, this wasn't actually part of my speech, that I'm back here since March 20, so it's been almost a year that I wasn't in the office. The art managed to bring me back to do this speech here in my private office with this she worked on the background. So first of all, already we obtained something through art. Um, but I'm here to speak about how we got involved into the art 
collection and to uh, using art as a tool. So uh, we started when we seen what London Trade Art actually did with one of their clients, Withers, in one of the exhibition that they created for them uh, in Milan and, and in and in the Los Angeles as well. We we seen uh, actually how uh, beautiful was it first of all, and how clients really uh, clients in, in, in engagement started, and how everyone really interacted through those in, in the exhibition and events. So we got a little bit jealous, and we started that we really wanted. Something like that as well, and we ask uh, London Trade Art to help us to to, to achieve something like that. So uh, we did an event, an evening event here in in London in Mayfair, uh, where we have the office. Um, we rented London Trade Art rented for us a gallery where we did a one week exhibition, and one evening we did um, an event where we invited a lot of our uh, dealers, clients, and friends, and it was quite nice. We did uh, London Trade Art took care of everything from the catering to the exhibition, of course. Uh, they did something very nice. There was naming the cocktail. There was very fancy cocktail bar, naming the cocktail with the art uh, uh, and the principle that we were trying to express through the exhibition. And um, and and was actually a nice evening because a member, if there was three or four members of London team working through our friends and our clients into the exhibition, trying to explain the principle and what the artists were expressing through the art. Uh, that was uh, uh, in line with the principle that we were trying to express as a company, so our values. Um, we did as well a DJ set in the evening that was a, was very nice and it's now part of a memory because it was a long time ago where we could all meet up and squeeze together in a small place. So uh, luckily, I mean, it's just, it's just a memory, but hopefully we can do it again soon. So from these artworks, we started our corporate exhibition. So uh, uh, some of them, most of them, were moved here in our office in Piccadilly. I see them from my position right here. And, um, and we integrated with some new uh, dedicated artwork for, for our office. Um, the idea was to create something beautiful for the world, something cool, and uh, and then design the office somehow. And uh, was very important for us as well, as Francesca mentioned before, to increase our corporate social responsibility and doing it through art was the, the, the way that we've seen at the time. Um, the, the, the key was to express our value through our corporate collection. Uh, I want to give some practical example. Uh, one artist, the one that you, you see displayed in, in my office, uh, for instance, she used those to, those to do this kind of art she does uh, with this pigment of minerals, which by definition are very resilient uh, to weather condition. So they're resilient to any weather condition. And our strategy aims to be performing and be resilient in any market condition. There is a saying that goes like making money, whatever the weather. So the idea was expressing this principle through the same principle that the artists wanted to do with this art. Another example, a mosaic that we have there uh, from the uh, artist Diego uh, Miguel Mirabella, uh, which aim, the, the, the artwork weighs like 70, 75 kilos, so are very strong and heavy. And the, the idea was to express the solidity and the many different components and together can create something beautiful, so much as team, team for us, the team, many different type of people uh, all together can create something strong. Another one that we have in the other side, in the other room of the office is, uh, is something that we actually commission. So I feel a little bit like uh, uh, the, the big guys there, Francesca mentioned before. Um, we, uh, we, this, we commissioned this one was, uh, we, we seen in the exhibition a small um, artwork uh, by the artist Lapo Simeone, which uh, uh, was black. And, and it's called skin is a lot of layers of spray, like our clients, a lot of layers of spray creating a nice visual effect. And we ask him, can you make it big and can you make it red? And he actually did it and was, I mean, we, we really like it is in the other office. Um, now, the London Trader team will hate me for this, but I have to say that heart is a great marketing tool. I mean, it gives you the occasion to pick up the phone and speak about something that is not what you're trying to sell. So you pick, you pick up the phone, you call your client, and you talk about uh, the new hardware that you acquired or uh, the new exhibition that you are planning to do. And so you're not trying to sell something, but it breaks the ice, it breaks the conversation, uh, and it's a great tool for us. Uh, our plan for the future is actually keep rolling and integrate this collection 
Uh, we are due to open a new office in Milan, in San Babila, in the center of, of the city. And we have already commissioned some art uh, to be done there in, in dialogue with the London office. And uh, the, the, we did a, a commission London to that to do a, a rotation of exhibition, so temporary exhibition as well, alongside with the permanent pieces. So we, we, our involvement uh, is more and more. And um, again, we want to use these post pandemic, hopefully, to get an excuse to meet in person some of our clients and friends. The idea is uh, now we got, everyone got lazy with these WebEx, Zoom, everything. Uh, we, 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 if, if I ask someone for a meeting, they will just send me a link. So the idea, I want to give an excuse to come in the office, see, because in person is much, much better. And, and again, we can break the ice by explaining how that specific arc or express some specific principle, which is what we actually try to achieve the philosophy of the company itself. And so from there, I started to talk about the product and what we're trying to sell. It's a nice way to get to the, to the point somehow for me, at least for us. Um, so uh, the, 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 um, the, the idea as well, in terms of uh, using art post pandemic is, bringing back employees in the office. Everyone got extremely lazy. The commuting is from the bedroom to the living room and uh, to the bed to the sofa is, is, is you know, making someone coming back in the office is, is gonna be a challenge. I think for a lot of employers, definitely for, for, for us at Red Edge, myself personally, uh, I need an excuse. Um, so the idea is for instance, try to vote uh, for which one of those are to, to acquire next, uh, which one to commission, uh, do some, some of, sort of game which involve all the members of the team to understand and decide together. So because everyone wants to be part of decision making in the corporate. So this is one of the side that we could offer. Um, the, the, the other idea that I've had, and I may spoil it for some of the Red Edge uh, guys, they are connected to the to the conference, so just just do like that. Uh, the 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 idea is to as a part of the compensation package, so at the bonus at the end of the year, using the share ownership uh, that Francesca has mentioned that uh, London Trans is offering as a part of the bonus. So give some shares of art as part of uh, the year end bonus, and and those shares of some artwork that we own in the in in the firm that would be great. So everyone can walk in the through the door and say, I own a bit of it, and and if it just feels better to me, I think is is a good is a good uh, way of uh, being in the office and stay better somehow. Um, to conclude, because it's St. Patrick Day and everyone deserves a pint. Uh, after all of, uh, of a long lay. Uh, my two cents is that having a corporate collection is not just for the big guys, it's not just for, just for Deutsche Bank and, 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 and for whatever huge company could be, it's, it's for small institutions like we are. And, um, and it could be very affordable because we can start as we did by not buying anything. It's just about renting and keeping it for six months rotating it whenever we want, have something fresh on the wall. And then I'm sure that someone would buy something because it's just temptation. It's there, you like it, you don't want to see it go and, and you end up buying it. So it, it's, it's the best temptation. And uh, at the same time, you can play around with it from team building to helping with sales and, and, and in general client relationship. So thank you very much for the, the attention and enjoy some project day. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to the rest of our speakers, to Francesca, to Luigi. Um, thank you to everyone who has connected today. I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Um, we will be circulating the webinar recording around, so please keep an eye on your inboxes. Um, and if you have any further questions for um, our speakers, then please send us an email at info at londontradeart.co.uk, and we will aim to answer you as quickly as possible. And until then, as Andrea said, enjoy St. Patrick's Day and stay safe and well. Thank you, everyone.